I recently visited Europe and suddenly I had a sharp reminder of what could make Canada an ideal country. In this video, I will share my list of three things, just three things that can make Canada perfect. Let's dive in. A few weeks ago, I took a trip from Edinburgh to London. There are 30 trains per day in between Edinburgh and London. 30! Now, let's take a look at the equivalent route in Canada, Ottawa-Toronto. It's the most traveled route in the entire country. There are only 9 non-stop trains between Ottawa and Toronto. 9 per day, not per hour. You'll say, but Canada doesn't have that many people. Come on, it has enough people. But the reason for inconvenient rail system is that people prefer traveling by car. Canada is the only country in G7 that doesn't have high-speed rail. I thought it was a joke the first time I heard that. If there was a reliable, frequent and high-speed rail connection between cities, how many people would still drive if you can get somewhere twice as fast? In Europe, trains are a fast and effective way to get around, connecting cities with ease. That allows people to live outside the city without becoming car-dependent. Imagine if Canada had a high-speed rail system connecting major cities like Windsor, Toronto, Ottawa and Montreal. Imagine you are in Toronto and three hours later you are in Montreal. Believe it or not, the Canadian government tried to imagine that too. Proposals to build high-speed rail in various corridors in Canada started back in the early 2000s. Study after study would show benefits of having a high-speed connection between cities in the Calgary-Edmonton corridor and Quebec City-Windsor corridor, Montreal to New York and Boston, and even Vancouver and Seattle. Lots of money was spent on feasibility studies only for the provincial governments to shut it down. And while the Canadian government envisions trains operating at speed of 200 km per hour in the Quebec City-Windsor corridor, the rest of the world is already two steps ahead with trains running at 300 km per hour or even faster. Look at it! Morocco's trains are twice as fast as Canada's. And it's not just about high-speed trains. Canada's public transit system in general needs a huge upgrade. Buses are often slow or don't show up, and routes are poorly designed. Sometimes you have to take two or three buses just to get somewhere, and their schedules are never perfectly aligned, so you end up wasting 15 minutes waiting for the next bus to arrive, and often it's just a bus stop on a soulless, empty intersection. And that's not all. How do you like this concept? You have to drive to the train station, park your car on a huge parking lot, and then take the train to get to the city to work. Yes, I'm talking about GO trains in GTA. Taking a bus to get to the station doesn't make sense, since bus arrival times rarely correlate with train departure times. And if you arrive earlier, there is nothing to do at the train station. There are zero shops, points of interest, cafes or restaurants. There's just a huge wasted space for parking. And that's how thousands of Canadians commute to work. That's how I commute to work. And I live just 50 kilometers away from downtown Toronto. And it takes me more than one hour one way. Still, it's better for me than being stuck in a traffic on a highway. At least I can read a book, relax, or do some work while I'm on a train. But surprisingly, most Canadians don't think this way. 8 out of 10 commuters use a car to travel to work, and only 10% use public transit. No wonder why provincial governments cannot justify investing into improving public transit. It's like a vicious circle. People don't use public transit because it's inefficient and government don't improve public transit because people don't use it. The car-dependent culture is strong in Canada. And if you want to travel from one town in GTA to another, it's impossible without a car, unless you want to travel through Union Station in Toronto downtown, since all trains only go to Toronto first, and from there you can take another train elsewhere. If only we had a smarter, more efficient public transit, commuting for work or leisure would be so much more pleasant. We would reduce traffic congestion, have fewer car accidents on highways, less reliance on cars will create better opportunities for us to connect with our community. Imagine the environmental benefits too, less air pollution from fewer emissions from all those cars clogging up roads, which makes sense, because Canada is advertising itself as oh-so-environmentally-friendly country. 
A study made by Transport for London has measured that introducing the Crossrail, a high-frequency, high-capacity railway connecting London to suburbs, added 42 billion pounds to the UK economy, supported 60,000 jobs and the reduced travel times, leading to productivity benefits estimated at 15 billion pounds. Efficient transit is good for the economy and its people. Investing into public transit unlocks more business opportunities. How many of us decide to pass on a social event just because getting to the venue is the pain in the butt? Improving this would give people more freedom to move, shop, and even travel within the country without thinking twice about it. There is something that's really hard to ignore – the homelessness and drug addiction issues in Canada. There are high levels of correlation between the two. The longer a person is homeless, the higher the chance they become drug addicts. And nearly 30% of homeless people report drug addiction as the main reason for losing a home. We know it's only gotten worse since the pandemic. Opioid-related deaths alone have doubled since 2019. The fentanyl crisis is terrifying and it's heartbreaking to see how many lives it affects. This year alone, 80% of all opioid-related deaths involved fentanyl. This substance is 50 times more potent and is commonly mixed in other recreational drugs because it's way cheaper than other opioids and party drugs. Anastasia's co-worker lost her son just last year due to fentanyl, and all he wanted was to simply have a little bit of fun at the college party. You can see it in cities across the whole country, Homeless people, many of whom are battling addiction, sleeping on the streets, under bridges, riding public transit, and struggling to get by. And honestly, it's scary. It makes you think twice about riding the subway or walking home in the evening, especially in bigger cities like Vancouver or Toronto. Homelessness was declared a national disaster back in November 1998. Yet, nothing substantial has been done to improve the issue. This crisis isn't just about safety, it's putting immense pressure on our social services, healthcare system and, of course, the tax system. Today, the country is spending $7 billion on homelessness in Canada to support shelters, medical expenses, police, emergency rooms, ambulances, paramedics, social workers, rehabs, but it seems to be getting only worse. And the worst part is that talking about tangible and realistic solutions to homelessness is kind of a taboo. As soon as you start these conversations, all you hear is, but those are vulnerable population, they need our help, they need our support, which only leads to more money being poured into supporting the crumbling system and no tangible solution in sight. If Canada could tackle this issue head-on, our overall quality of life would improve, both for those affected by the addiction and for the rest of the community. It's time for parents and schools to prioritize educating kids and teenagers about destructive consequences of drug abuse. Parents, please talk to your children. Do not rely on schools to teach your children what to do. Even if you don't know where to start, there are so many documentaries you could watch together and learn about types of drugs, how they work and their detrimental effects. Please be patient and explain to your kids all the consequences of wrong life choices. It's also time for the society to start talking about mental health seriously. 50% of individuals with severe mental disorders suffer from substance abuse. If you are suffering from mental health issues, you are not alone. Seek help. Turn to your loved ones before you make that wrong decision and turn to drugs. And it's time for Canadian government to start handling this situation, even if it will upset some people. Maybe it's worth considering reducing welfare benefits and providing permanent shelter instead. Free money from the government is equal to drug needle. It's very easy to get hooked on and very hard to get off it. Are we discouraging the homeless from reintegrating back into the society by handing out freebies and letting them back out on the street? Shouldn't we be teaching them life skills and facilitating their transition into the society? Finland, Scotland and Netherlands all have implemented policies focusing on permanent residency provision for homeless, and they've shown nearly 50% reduction in homelessness. Permanent shelter, no cash. Finally, doctors should stop prescribing opioids left and right. Patients must be able to treat the source of their pain instead of turning to addictive medical opioids for a quick fix. 
Sadly, there is no quick fix to the drug addiction and homeless problem, but addressing mental health and strengthening the education on addictions is a good start. Cities would feel safer, cleaner, and more connected. Parks would become suitable for chilling on the grass or playing with kids. And the money spent on emergency services could be redirected to prevention and rehabilitation programs that actually work. Let's move on to a lighter topic. It's something that ties into public health and well-being. Canadian cities, for the most part, are designed with cars in mind. You see it everywhere, massive shopping plazas surrounded by enormous parking lots, residential neighborhoods cut off by highways, lack of sidewalks or unsafe bike paths that no sane cyclist will use. This car-centric design makes cities feel disconnected. If you don't have a car, you are disconnected. And as we've learned, public transit is no help here. And if you do have a car, you are stuck in traffic. TomTom Tom traffic index shows that a driver in Toronto spent on average 255 hours in rush hour traffic last year. Just think about it, 255 hours per year is 10 days of doing nothing but staring at the traffic, breathing the fumes and fuming about stupid drivers around you. And then we complain about how unproductive Canadians are. When going through sorry, driving through residential areas in Canada, it's easy to notice that every household has two or three or sometimes four cars. And having a car is expensive in Canada. It costs more than 1300 a month to own a car. And then we complain about how expensive life in Canada is. In comparison, monthly public transit pass in Toronto is $156. How is it a norm to be forced to pay $1,300 every month in order to waste 10 days a year stuck in traffic? It sounds like an evil reality show joke. It's a middle-class money trap, that's what it is. In contrast, European and many Asian cities are designed to be walkable. You can stroll from one neighborhood to the next, stopping by points of interest, stimulating your brain. You stop by shops or cafes and run into your friends or make new ones over a shared book interest or a unique piece of clothing. And that makes the whole city feel more alive. When you walk, you are more likely to spend money locally, whether it's window shopping or grabbing a coffee, so walkability actually stimulates local economy. It also obviously has indisputable health benefits and, in turn, reduces the strain on the healthcare system in the long run. More walking means less obesity, fewer heart problems and a generally healthier population. A study made by Blue Zone Group has identified five places in the world with the highest proportion of people living over 100 years old. They have found eight common elements that unlock longevity. And natural movement, that is, regular, moderate physical activity integrated into daily routines, along with community engagement and stress reduction, are all parts of a recipe for a long, happy and healthy life. Do you want to live a long and happy life? Walkable cities just feel better. Kids can bike or walk to school safely. You can meet your neighbors and there is more of a sense of community. Loneliness is a legitimate issue many people in Canada complain about, but it can be solved only if we got more people out walking on the streets and making those streets feel alive. And tying it all back to our previous point, we discussed feeling of loneliness and disconnection is one of the top reasons for drug abuse. If Canada could make urban spaces more walkable, it would create healthier, more vibrant communities and set Canada up for success. Because, after all, it's people that make or break the country. Now you're probably eagerly wondering about my bonus point, and I know I'm not alone in this one. Less sugar in food, please! North America in general has a huge problem with adding sugar to everything. You pick up a loaf of bread or a can of soup and it's packed with sugar. And not just normal sugar, but high fructose corn syrup crap. This is a number one contributor to obesity and other health issues, which in turn put even more strain on the healthcare system. 30% of Canadians live with some form of diabetes or pre-diabetes, each spending up to $20,000 on diabetes medication annually. Add that to the car expenses we've mentioned previously. These are scary numbers. You can only imagine how much strain that condition alone puts on the medical system in this country. 
sugar and fast food are killing people and making Canadians poorer. It's a cycle that has to be broken and frankly can easily be broken if only the country were to adopt a healthier food production policy and actively promote a healthier lifestyle. How? For example, look at how Japan cares about nutrition and even teaches parents what to pack into kids' lunchbox. Combine that with better walkability in the country and suddenly the healthcare situation in Canada will look much better and we, people, will be complaining less about huge waiting times in hospitals. Canada is a wonderful place, but also such a young country with so many things to figure out. The housing, cost of living or healthcare crisis are a consequence of building cities that are not suitable for healthy and happy living. Perhaps changing zoning laws, building better neighborhoods and focusing on preventing health issues rather than treating them could be a good start. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. If you want to see more videos about making Canada a better place to live, subscribe to this channel for more. You can also support our channel by becoming a YouTube member or through Patreon. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Go take a walk.